We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm the host of uh, We Hold These Truths, and we're very lucky to have today our guest, Jose Palma, the Massachusetts TPS Committee Coordinator. Jose, welcome. Uh, Jose was born in El Salvador, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit what it was like growing up there and how you came to Massachusetts. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, as always, nice to see you, and uh, nice to see everyone uh, who's going to be watching the, uh, the video. Um, I grew up in El Salvador. I was born in 1976. Um, right after I was born in 1980, El Salvador went into a big civil war where my parents, who were farmers and were working and know how to work the land, uh, were pretty much forced to move from the countryside and move to the city. So uh, I grew up in a city called Usulutan. Um, you know, growing up there as a refugee, pretty much my parents lost everything, starting from scratch. And life was rough, but I think and after, you know, my age at this time, I start to believe that sometimes life is training you for what's coming forward. Hmm. And that's the way I take it. I think it was rough. It was a little bit difficult for some times, but here we are enjoying life with my beautiful kids. And what can I say more than that was a training for what was coming. Right. After. Well, could you describe how, how, what it was like coming here and how you decided to make the, uh, the, the journey and what that was like for you? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a combination, actually. Um, I, I was sharing with you that last night my, my mother came. Um, she got a visa like maybe like four years ago. We didn't see each other for a period of time of like 14 years. Then we saw each other and then you know, she was able to get uh, a visa. So how I was growing up in El Salvador, for example, we used to play just counting the airplanes and dreaming with that opportunity that one day to, you know, fly in an airplane. And, you know, as close as we can be was just seeing them flying by and counting them uh, playing uh, as a kid, like who can see more airplanes. Um, and, and also, growing up in El Salvador during the Civil War, where uh, the United States has a lot of influence in what was happening, um, we also grew up very, uh, some people say, Americanized. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, like people in El Salvador speak Spanish, but we were listening English music, and then, you know, like receiving also all the time hearing that the United States is that great country where uh, if you can make it, you know, you will have an opportunity to, uh, you know, achieve your dreams and mm. education and different, different things. So there is a moment uh, when I was growing up that I was like, I am 10, 22 years old. If I haven't been able to go to college and if I haven't been able to achieve higher education, 
how will my three little sister will be able to do it? Mm -hmm. So, and then not seeing any opportunity in El Salvador, you know, uh, and, and hearing so much about the United States, mm -hmm. um, I took the decision and I said, I will try it. And, you know, the, the first question many people ask is like, why you didn't come with visa, for example? Mm -hmm. But then um, when you start explaining the process that in order to get a visa, if you are, let's say, from El Salvador, you pretty much need to be a millionaire. You need to be a rich person to be able to apply for a visa right. and get a visa. So I didn't have any other choice, much more than just, you know, coming as many other people come, undocumented and doing what and, and anybody around the world will do, trying to get to that place where you are willing to work mm -hmm. hard and hoping that you will achieve your dream. So I decided to take that risk. Um, I crossed Guatemala and then Mexico, and then I made it to the United States. It sounds like a three steps easy, but there is, there, there is, there is a lot going on in, in between yeah. that you know, I can go on and on and on uh, for sure. But there are experiences that sometimes marks your life uh, for example, one of them is that when we were crossing part of Mexico, we were told, you know, you, you are coming, you, you hire a coyote, and the coyote usually tells you, don't worry about it, the trip is going to be easy, we're going to, you know, we're going to go in buses, and, and some part of, depending where we are, we may go in, uh, you know, in an airplane, things like that, but they don't tell you the difficult part. For example, when, when we were crossing one part of Mexico, I remember like, you know, it was like midnight. They said, we're gonna go into that tank. And that was like a big tank uh, where, uh, I usually explain it that it's like the, the tanks where people transport gasoline. You just see the big tanks running around. So I remember that night they said like about midnight, they said, you guys gonna go inside that tank. And we're talking about 125 people fitting within that tank. We went in and they said, it's gonna be a short ride. Yeah, that short ride ended up being 22 hours. So 22 hours. 22 wow. hours. With everything about midnight, like pretty much people telling you like, grab four bottles of water, no food, no nothing, and good luck, we will see you on the other side. So, you know, experiences like that is what sometimes make you feel like, oh man, I'm so lucky that I'm still alive. Like, you know, you see on the news so, so many people right. dying and trying different things. And then there are some other experiences that I can, you know, I can probably share too. And, and you said you were in the desert in Arizona lost for a while? I yeah. That. Yeah, that, that was another, another also, another difficult part of the trip. That there are some part, like especially in my case, I, I came into the United States crossing the, the desert. So I remember, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know, I think, you know, like, I think if I were to be forced to go back to El Salvador and had that opportunity to try it again, yeah. I probably won't do it. Yeah. I won't do it because it's like, it was so hard. Yeah. So when we were ready to cross the border, we were in Mexico, Coyote said, we're gonna walk like 10 hours and we're gonna go to the other side. Somebody's gonna be waiting for you guys. You guys gonna go in a minivan and you guys are gonna go to Phoenix, Arizona. So we start walking. 10 hours in the middle of the night. Walking in the desert without even like, you don't know where you are. You just right. like, pretty much following the lead. So that day we were able to cross the border and we went to the highway ready to be picked up. Um, and then a, min a, a minivan came, we went on and the minivan broke down. Oh, wow. oh man, now we have to go back to the desert and wait for another one to come to pick us up. So what happened is that never came back. And mm. after like two or three days, some of us were like, especially one of my friends who was traveling with me, he was like, I'm not dying here. I don't care, I'm gonna walk to the highway and if I get arrested, I don't care. I, I, I just don't wanna die here. Okay. So, um, and because this is one of my friends who actually decided to take the trip because he knew I was coming in that trip. So I said like, I said to myself, you know, like why will I let him to go alone? If something happened, eventually his family is gonna be asking me like, Jose, what happened with my you know, my, my son, with my brother. Mm -hmm. And then, so we decided to go to the, uh, to the highway and somebody offered us a ride. 
and there was an old lady driving a pickup truck and offered us ride. So we were able to go on the car and then drive to Tucson, Arizona. And then I remember we, we, we got to Tucson, Arizona, and then the woman was talking to us in English, but we didn't speak English. I, 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 I knew a few words like, you know, very basic table, chair, things like that, the right. words that you learn in El Salvador. Right. I was a bad student anyway in that class. Teacher was coming here and I was going out on the other one thinking like, when I will use English? I don't need to learn English. Right. But that day, uh, I, I, you know, I, I hoped I knew a little bit more because the woman looked like she wanted to help us, oh, yeah. but we couldn't understand. So she ended up just saying like, pretty much like jump off my car and she continued her role. And, you know, we, by that time, we were like maybe two or three days that we, we haven't eaten, just wow. drinking some dirty water from the, you know, the desert, and that we were competing with some cows, like, who's going to drink that water that day? So it was, it was hard. It was hard. So eventually, um, you know, we saw an immigration officer, and my friend was like, hey, there is an immigration officer. Let's go. When many other people will run away, we actually went to him and said, hey, can you arrest us? We really want to go back to El Salvador. It has been so hard that we want to go back. So, um, you know, the officer actually was very friendly and, and everything and took us to the uh, detention center. We ended up in detained in uh, Florence, Arizona. I mm -hmm. spent like 27 days there. Um, after the 27 days, I, I was advised that I was uh, you know, one of those people that can apply for political asylum. Mm. And that's how I ended up applying for political asylum and being released and came oh, to right. Massachusetts. Actually, I came in June uh, 1998, so 23 years ago. 23 years ago, you were in Boston. Years ago. And, and, I, and, what, and what were you doing then? I know now you're the leader of the Massachusetts uh, Temporary Protective Status Committee, but what was it like when you first came here? No, that you know, like I, I always share that I, I feel proud of what I have achieved, and also about the opportunities and and friends and relationship I have, I have gained during my 23 years here. I came with a plastic bag with a bunch of paper, immigration papers that those are pretty much just telling you when you have to go back to court and probably eventually get deported. So when I came, I actually my plan was come here for work hard for two years and go back you know mm. like most of the time if you were to ask to an immigrant uh, let's say from El Salvador I always say El Salvador because it's where I where I am from and in the community I really know um, people will say I am coming here for two years I will work hard mm. get enough money to buy a house maybe a car and then I, I'm gonna go back mm -hmm. no one want to stay for too long but eventually you get into this trap of like, you never make any money because things are so expensive and right. everything right. that you ended up here and you know, things start getting a little, you know, taking a different way. But when I came, I, I have done different type of jobs. I have done pretty much everything. I, at the beginning, I worked in the construction. Then I worked and uh, I was doing maintenance. Then I was cleaning buildings in Boston. I, I have been a truck driver, like doing milk delivery. They're living all over the place in Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Um, I have been also at the same time as I was raising my family of four uh, kids born yeah. here. Uh, I also have been taking classes. Um, right. And so that taking classes, learning English, you know, I finished an associate degree of paralegal. Right. Dreaming about continuing my education and everything. That's how, you know, like uh, maybe I bought a house in 2006, then we lost it with the whole thing about the economy. We lost like maybe like $30,000 there. Wow. But we bought another house, yeah. this, time, this time around a single family home, which is a little more uh, safe in a way. Um, so I have my house, I have my kids, and kids are going to college and everything. Um, and through my education, also, I have learned and eventually got involved in the community organizing. Mm -hmm. When it comes to community organizing jobs, I have done, you know, organizing to pass the DREAM Act, which mm -hmm. many people say now DACA, 
that easy, but it, it right. wasn't that easy. Right. Uh, we won DACA based on organizing and rallying and doing different uh, activities. Uh, then I have been also lucky enough to help people to apply for documentation. Funny enough, I, I don't qualify, but I have been able to help people right. to apply for citizenship, permanent residency and everything. Um, I have been also, I was a political director for three years. I actually was part of the pol political director team for People's Action, where we were interviewing uh, former um, candidate uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Bernie Sanders, and all those candidates. And then supporting some different issues here in Massachusetts, like when we won um, Earn Sick Time, I was coordinating 37 cities up in the North Shore area uh, when we won. So many people say nowadays, like, oh, we have earned sick time, we raised minimum wage, but there is so much work that we have done, and I feel right. proud of being part of those uh, right. teams. But lately, I have been kind of like fighting my own fight right. since in 2001. <clears throat> I was able to get TPS, Temporary, temporary protective, protective Status, status which yeah. is an immigration status that it gives you the opportunity to get a work authorization, social security, driver license, but it doesn't give you the opportunity to move forward and apply for permanent residency. But that immigration status is actually the key for all the things that I have been able to achieve in a way, because right. I have been able to apply for a job, you know, take classes, but you can't apply for permanent residency but I can. over 20 years. You have to, every year or so, you have to pay how much? $400 or more? To renew it, it, yeah. it has been $485. Get fingerprinted to make sure you Background live checks the and all cleanest things. life of anybody in this country. That's it. If you, if you commit two misdemeanors, you lose TPS, and therefore you can get into deportation procedure. So TPS has been protecting me since 2001. 20 years. About 20 years. And that was the difficult part. When the Trump administration came in power, one of the programs he was targeting was TPS. And he was pretty much saying, you guys have six months, prepare your things, and go back to your country. And that was, you know, his intention. Um, but we kind of like resist. And instead of like packing, we got organized. Right. And, and after 20 <laughs> years owning a house, I mean, you having know. four children, being a homeowner, like, you know, most, uh, I mean, most probably aren't homeowners, but are working here, paying taxes, paying the annual $480 fee. Yeah, and, and how will you pack when your kids don't even know the country you come from? They were all like, born here. <laughs> in the they United were States. all born here. Yeah. Like, and, 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 and TPS doesn't also, also doesn't allow you to travel abroad. Mm. Like, you are allowed to live here, but you cannot go back to even to your countries. <clears throat> and if you want to travel to your country, you have to apply for a permit. And that costs three hundred and sixty dollars. So it's like asking the U.S. government to allow you to travel to your country and be able to come back, and that costs you three hundred and sixty dollars. So if, like, let's say, uh, my wife and I we apply once to go to El Salvador, just the permit to be able to travel and come back more than seven hundred dollars. Wow. <laughs> Plus, if you pay somebody who you know who does your application and everything, people are spending more than one thousand dollars just for the permit to travel. And then you 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 know you right. add everything else. But um, so in 2017 the Trump administration tried to uh, take our TPS, but I think it, many of us have done different things and we have learned different things that mm. we decided to get organized. I actually helped to start a group here in Massachusetts and, and also uh, I helped to, bring, to, uh, to build mm. something at the national level. Actually, uh, in 2019, I was able to get uh, one year of my regular job to be the mm -hmm. national coordinator to lead this effort. Um, that now we can say we feel proud of the work because we not only survive the Trump <laughs> administration intention of kicking us out. I mean, we are about 400,000 families. It, you know, like, how can you do that? Things, things like that. When people are not asking for anything more than just allow people to continue living here. So, 
we were able to survive by using the courts, like mm -hmm. we, sue, we sued the government for, for the way the Trump administration was canceling TPS. And then we organized and worked with legislators to, uh, to move legislations like HR 6, um, the, the uh, Dream and Promise Act, which I feel proud to say that uh, at the beginning and stage of that, com of that legislation is the one I testify in Congress right. and kind of like justifying why they should, they should uh, pass a legislation to provide permanent residency instead of, you know, kind of like cutting short our dreams and trying to kick us mm -hmm. out. So now I think we were able to survive the Trump administration through different organizing tools. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, we, and now we continue um, talking with the Biden administration and the Democratic Party and pretty much, pretty much telling them we don't want to continue being protected by TPS. We want permanent residency. Right. I think we have earned it through yeah. everything we have done. After over 20 years, all your children are here, your family's here, you own a home, been paying taxes and uh, everything else for over 20 years. So where does it stand right now in terms of being able to become a permanent resident? Is like if somebody were to ask me right now, when will you become permanent residency? I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I think opportunities to start opening in different ways. Like for example, one probably opportunity in my case will be when my one of my kids turn 21, which is going to happen next year. Uh, there is pro, pro, there, there is the possibility that will open one window uh, to do a family petition, and eventually, mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I, which are the only two TPS, then everyone else. Well, we have my my nephew who is not a U.S. citizen. He's actually uh, already qualified for permanent residency, but the rest of the family, U.S. citizen, and my wife and I, who are the like the one bringing the money to yeah. pay the bills, are the one at risk of uh, you know like lo losing our immigration status. But if I, if, if I were to say by when, maybe through a family petition, I will have the, an opportunity right. next year. But then for everyone else, who for, for the family that don't have kids or, or are not married with a U.S. citizen or there is no other opportunity, people don't know. Right. People don't kids know. Kids are younger. You know, kids uh, are younger or they don't have right. kids in some cases. Right. Uh, pretty much... What we know is that for right now, we are protected until October 4th. If nothing, let's say nothing were to happen between now and October 4th, but by October 4th, people will lose their immigration status. That's of this year, 2021. Yeah, 2021. Yeah. So that's a little bit of disappointment even with the new administration, that even with the new administration they came in, they have been more friendly. We have met with a little more often and talk about the issue. Um, actually, one of my colleagues, uh, another TPS recipient, was meeting with the president a few weeks ago to mm. talk about TPS. So there are conversations, and there is a hope that something will happen in the next a few weeks mm. but uh, or month. But right now, what we know for sure is that October 4th is the deadline. And if nothing were to happen, on October 4th, close to 300,000 families will be losing their immigration right. status. Yeah, because all the countries have been able to get another extension, but countries like El Salvador, which we are close to 200,000 people from El Salvador, mm -hmm. protected with TPS. People from Honduras who are more or less like 50,000 people from Honduras. Uh, Nicaragua, which is a smaller community, but mm -hmm. you know, two or 3,000 people. Uh, and then Nepal with another 15. Right. 15. So, so, so what could people who are U.S. citizens do to allow you and thousands of other TPS holders to stay in this country after 20 or more years of contributing, paying taxes, working, raising families? Yeah. What, what, what do you think they could do? What's your advice to them? If, if, if we see the campaign from Massachusetts, I think we need to pressure a little bit 
we need to pressure a little bit more the Democratic Party as a whole. Because mm -hmm. sometimes legislators, you have some good legislators and they will try to do as much as they can. Mm -hmm. But there are some other people within the Democratic Party who are more uh, um, conservative. They don't want to take, you know, like the right, they don't want to do right. the right move. Um, I think that people can continue pushing the Democratic Party through mm -hmm. their own legislators, especially the uh, the federal representation. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should be, people should be pushing a little bit more the federal representation mm -hmm. and asking them to take more leadership role within mm -hmm. the political party. If people have all the family members or friends in other states, mm -hmm. um, that's another way also how contacting your family member and friends for them to contact their local uh, that would be good. Federal representation. And, and if does. people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? I know you have a website. Uh, yeah. What would be the best way? I, to I think find you go, out? go into the website, masstps.com. Masstps.com. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the way to go. And then they can send us, mm -hmm. you know, message or email. Uh, also on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We are on Facebook. We have a mm -hmm. Massachusetts TPS committee. Uh, and Facebook, so they can send us emails yeah. or, or messages to get in contact and ask oh, any question. Great. And just, uh, we're almost out of time, but for all your, from all your organizing, do you have any particular, you know, sort of short advice for people, either people in this country and also from other countries about, you know, what they can do uh, to organize themselves for whatever problems they have? I mean, my advice is like most of the time, and this is what I said in a, in a rally last weekend. I mm -hmm. said, usually big corporations and billionaires come together and they see the problem. And even if they don't get along, they decide to put a few million dollars together to mm -hmm. fight and protect their industry or their mm -hmm. corporation. And I said, for, for those of us that are no millionaires and are not rich, we have the people. So we really need to work with people. We really need to get together. And this is the thing. Sometimes we have been, in the United States specifically, people have been trained to, one, to say, we don't have enough. We cannot mm -hmm. share with everyone. Mm -hmm. But how can that be that the billionaires are getting, are making way more money than before, but poor people are getting poor, no matter where you come from, whether you're black, Latino, Asian, whatever you come. If you are poor, you're getting poor. You're right. getting less money. And the other thing in the United States is also always making you afraid of others. Others mean whatever issue they want to raise. Even you are afraid, you, they want made to make you afraid from terrorists, if, uh, from those Latinos that are coming to steal your jobs. Right. Always like that. Right. Because that's the way they, mm, they take advantage. So I will say we need to talk about issues. We need to get together and we need to organize. Good, Billionaire have the money, we got the people. You do. Okay. <laughs> so, say Palma, the Massachusetts coordinator of the uh, TPS committee, thanks for being here. Thank and you, we Mike. hope you'll stay in touch with us. So, I'm yeah. Michael Jacoby Brown for uh, talking to you today, and thanks a lot for tuning in.